Welcome to the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. It's a perspective on the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and if you haven't heard the last few episodes, we are still on lockdown due to COVID-19, so we're still on quarantine, but shout out to my crew who's out there, Dominique, my boy cousin Damo, J.O., and D.T. Dave, my boys out there with, with me from day one. Hope these gentlemen out there doing well and that we will one day reunite back here on the vault to review the classics. So peace to y'all, man, and peace to everyone else out there, all the listeners. Want to give a shout out, of course, to all my listeners around the world. We are continuing to see the numbers go up just to give you an idea of how things have been progressing. Over the last month, we've seen our usual check ins from the usual suspects of countries. And in April 2020, we saw, of course, uh, check-ins from right here back at home stateside of USA, but good showings by Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, also France, Germany, Sweden, Mexico, the Netherlands, Brazil, Norway, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Italy, Belgium, Greece, Ireland, India, Nigeria, Switzerland, Chile, Spain, New Zealand, Poland, Taiwan, Japan, among others. We want to thank you all for listening to us out there. The listenership continues to grow, so shout out to all the listeners worldwide. We do it here for you on the Vault Classic Music Reviews, and our sayings here on the Vault is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics, or NBTC. And today we are going into a bonus segment. It's a bonus segment of Cards, Dominoes, Drinks, and Smoke, where we chop it up over discussion topics of the day around all your retro music topics and Go ahead and share a little bit of our opinion. So today our topic is classic albums and classic music. What makes a classic album? One of the biggest topics that we talk about specifically in hip hop music, but then also in R&B and the other genre we cover here in reggae music, as far as what makes a classic album and truly makes it classic. So these are one of the things that I think we've, talked about here within the genre so much, especially in the last few years. And really, it all kind of depends on what area you're coming from and your style, what you listen to culturally, what you like. But there are some hallmarks that need to be taken into consideration when considering a classic. So we're going to jump into that a little bit today on cards, dominoes, drinks, and smoke. Now, we are going to take a look at what the dictionary says is the definition of a classic. So the dictionary says that a classic is adjective, meaning that it can be judged over a period of time to be of the highest quality and outstanding of its kind, i.e. a classic novel. Number two, remarkably and instructively typical, i.e. Hamlet is the classic example of a tragedy. As a noun, a work of art of recognized and established values i.e. these books or albums have been classics. If you look at what they talk about, these first three definitions, a work of art recognized and established value, a remarkably and instructively typical or judged over a period of time to be of the highest quality and outstanding of its time. And that's what I think is the classic definition of a classic to use the word, but judged over a period of time. And that's really what the premise of our show, the Vault Classic Music Reviews does. We took the premise of taking and reviewing so-called potential classic albums from 20 years, 25 years, and 30 years. And we started at 20 because we felt that we it needed to be some time in order to be able to let a classic truly develop. Like you had to let the music breathe, as they say, in order to be able to determine whether it was a classic or not. Now, here's some of the things within our culture, which we do entirely way too fast. Highly anticipated release, or a release from one of our artists that we follow, the big names in the industry, comes out with an album. The album's great, and in the moment, we listen to it. And in the days and weeks afterwards, and maybe even in the months afterwards, we tend to play this album over and over again because it's of high quality. It's a great album. But then what starts to happen is that in those days and weeks afterwards, 
the word that gets thrown out a little bit too much about some of these albums is it's a classic. <laughs> I mean, raise your hands if out there, if you've heard albums come out, let's say maybe just to even within the last five to seven years or so, you've heard an album has come out and somebody has deemed it as a classic a day, the same day, a couple of days or a week afterwards saying that, Oh, this album is a classic. It's happened a lot, especially in these last few years. I would even say it's happened a lot in the last 20 years that we've deemed albums classics. Now, the problem with that is that we get into a point where sometimes those albums don't stand the test of time, as we like to say at the end of our episodes. And as time goes on, they don't age very well. We're going to take a look about what helps to determine a classic. And I had some made some notes in regards to this as far as what makes an album classic. We got the dictionary definition, dictionary definition. Now, how the media defines classics. Now, if we want to talk about who are the toughest critics when it comes to talking about and determining, determining what a classic is, the media is definitely right back right up there. And for our genre of music, we look at a lot of the publications that come out because the publications in the beginning of popular urban music were the standard when it came to being able to judge what an album's quality was. Hence, I'll take a look in as far as when it comes to hip hop and R&B music. We looked at publications like The Source, like Vibe, later on Double XL. Some people even remember Blaze magazine. Uh, we also looked at stuff like Word Up. Uh, we looked on online websites like rapreviews.com. DVD reviewed hip hop on his hip hop site back in the day. You would see reviews, of course, in Rolling Stones. There would be stuff in Spin. Also, the Village Voice, Robert Christigal was one of them. He was one of the most popular music critics, actually. And he was a very tough critic, especially when it came to some uh, non-hip hop and urban music. But in urban music, he was a very tough critic when it came to being able to pr please him. If we're talking about from a hip hop perspective, what if you're looking at what the standard of the media perception of what an album is and its quality? What do we look to, of course? The source. The Source was the hip-hop Bible for a lot of people for a long time, and they went by that classic mic rating. If you looked and saw what the mic rating was for The Source, The Source had mic ratings, and you could see what their mic ratings were, and you could tell by looking at The Source, they would have, based on the type of mics, what type of album they thought that it was as far as the quality is concerned. Starting really when you would look at anything, because anything under three as far as The Source was concerned would not necessarily be something worth checking out or would be something that you would check for for years. As far as the what they had for their rating system, three mics would be something that would be a solid project. Three and a half mics would be dope, worth checking out. Four would be an album of better than average to a very good album. Four and a half mics would be a great album, just a step under a classic, and five mics would be a certified classic. Now, there were not many albums that received that classic rating. Initially, here are the albums that got the classic rating from the source. People Instinctive Travels in the Paths of Rhythms by Tribe Called Quest, Eric B. and Rock Kim, Let the Rhythm Hit Him, America's Most Wanted, Ice Cube, One for All, Brand Nubian, De La Soul by, is Dead by De La Soul, The Low End Theory by Tribe Called Quest, Illmatic by Nas, Life After Death by Notorious Big, Equemni versus from Outcast, The Blueprint from Jay Z, Stillmatic from Nas, The Fix from Scarface, The Naked Truth, Little Kim, True OG by Bum B, and My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy by Kanye West. Here were albums that were not rated upon their releases, and the source came out generally in the late 80s. Actually, the source started, I believe, in 1988. So here were albums that they rate that were not rated classics, but were later rated five mics in 2002. Run DMC, self-titled album, Radio by LL Cool J, License to Ill, Beasties Boys, Raising Hell, Run DMC, Criminal Minded, Boogie Down Productions, Paid in Full, Eric B. and Rakim, By All Meets Necessary, BDP, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, Public Enemy, Long Live the Kane by Big Daddy Kane, Critical Beatdown by Ultramatic Magnetic MCs, Straight Out of the Jungle by The Jungle Brothers, Strictly Business, EPMD, The Great Inventors by Slick Rick, Slick Rick, Straight Outta Compton, NWA, No One Can Do It Better, The DOC, and All Eyes On Me by Tupac. And here are albums that were originally received four and a half mics and were later re-rated re to five. It was Breaking Adams by Main Source, Death Certificate by Ice Cube, The Chronic, Dr. Dre, Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, Wu-Tang Clan, Ready to Die, Notorious Big, The Infamous by Mob Deep, 
only built for Cuban links Raekwon and 2001 Dre. Now, albums that originally received four mics and were later re-rated, re-rated to five is Grip It on Another Level, Ghetto Boys, Doggy Style by Snoop Doggy Dog, The Diary by Scarface, Me Against the World by Tupac, The Score by The Fugees, and Reasonable Doubt by Jay-Z. The rating system by the source used to be a bit of controversy back in the day. <laughs> I would say even in the later days of the source, into the late mid to late 90s, into the 2000s, there were some albums that got lower than four mics ratings that were definitely classics. We talked about one of them earlier this year. The Shining by Smith & Wesson received a three mic rating originally when it was rated in 1995. Now, you could talk to a lot of hip-hop heads. Uh, overwhelmingly, I would say the majority of them say that that album is a classic album. Another album that would be considered classic, an album like, like Water for Chocolate would be another one. It was written with an album that wasn't even rated four mics. It was rated, I think, three and a half. And I think that that's a classic. So there were a number of different ones that were out there. And then the stories have started to emerge about the source in terms of them rating albums that had a lot to do with the uh, with the labels that were advertising and the companies that were advertising in the source that they admittedly gave better ratings to those who were advertising and spending more money in the magazine, better ratings than it needed to be. And then you would get lower ratings for those who were not or those who were lesser known. Now, there are some albums. We reviewed a one a couple of weeks ago, Black Rob's Life Story. And that one received four and a half mics when it came out. And me and J.O. were here was like, yeah, man, hmm, I don't know about that. So you have the case where the source overrated albums as well. And I think there have been many more instances of the source overrating an album with this mic system and you being like, okay, I don't see where they got that from. But we do know that things in the source went down the tube and their credibility went down the tube quite as well. So just an idea as far as with media. Now, media is... They're going to be very strict when it comes to when they review music and also movies. They tend to hold it more so in a technical aspect. And we sort of we understand that. And cultural critics can be very, very hard on pieces of work, pieces of work and art. So sometimes you can look at a cultural review and a critic review and be like, OK, I can kind of see that. And then sometimes you just got to kind of take it for what it is to understand that. Some people's definitions and uh, of quality are going to be different than others. So it is subjective to a certain sense. In terms of the other part of this, as far as the fans perspective and what makes a classic album, fans are going to be a little bit different because all fans have their favorites. Everybody has their favorites. There's no if fans or buts about it that we all look at certain artists and we hold a soft spot in our heart for them. We definitely are fans of their work. So if you're a super fan of somebody, you're definitely going to regard their work a lot higher than somebody else. So fans, when it comes to defining classics at times, they tend to have rose-colored glasses, and that can skew your perception when it comes to determining the quality of an album. What I say, if you want to see a good example of that, is just go on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is a great place to see the debate of quality of albums between people who have differing perspectives from all over the country and all over the world and it's entertaining to say the least because the difference in opinions between some of these fans and the quality of certain albums is telling in regarding to see what they think of a quality of an album, whether it's classic or great or very good or not even good at all. So seeing the differing of pers perspectives is really entertaining and it's telling as well because I think culture plays into that. I think age and generations, I'll get into that a little bit later, plays into that as well. I also think that some people's perception of what they think for classic quality and what makes things up as far as the technical aspects are different as well. Like some regions and some places may not necessarily care about hardcore internal rhymes, multi-syllabic rhymes and bars over flow and feeling and over music as far as what you, whether you like, whether it's melodies or bass or overall song direction may play a may play a part in regard to whether you think a quality of an album is better of one artist versus another, or one era versus another. Fans define classics generally off things, and we use simplistic terms. The majority of us, the rank and file, the general population of us will use it. Does it have a lot of skips? How does it make me feel? How do I feel when I listen to this certain type of song? Am I playing rewind to play this track back because I love it so much? So those are general things that we can kind of all think about. But I'm going to get a little bit more into what 
makes a classic. And what I'm going to talk about next is what are the lines between a classic album, a great album, and a very good album? There are lines, but I think the lines aren't clearly as defined when we talk about quality of music as we think they are. So I'm going to start at the very top in terms of classics. What are we talking about when we define classic music or classic albums? I think off the break, we have to think about the most basic thing. It has to have outstanding content. So there has to be good music. It has to be great music. Not only that, but on classic albums, the music has to be exceptional. And it's a combination of a lot of different other things. It's a combination of things, but a balance between lyrics and or flow. A lot of classic albums actually have artists that have both, but some have one of the two and they do one very, very well, whether it's lyrics or flow really, really well in order to be able to get to that classic standard, the production. And we're not just talking about the beats per se. It's about the beats, um, how well those beats were done, how complex they are. And even in its simplicity, if it's done, if it's very simple, how great in its simplicity it makes it stand out that it seems like it would have taken forever to do. Like it's really complex. It's about the mixing, about the mastering, the levels. It's about the direction. Like we talk about producers, right? We think about beat makers, but when you think about the classic producers in the terms of someone like a Dr. Dre or someone like P Diddy or someone like a Russell Simmons or someone of that sort of stature, JD, not just people who are beat makers, but producers who actually look at the direction of the song, the mood, what the topics are, seeing how the direction of how it's done, how pretty much you take the individual parts of a song from lyrics to beats to mixing to mastering to everything and putting it all together and truly producing a song in the traditional sense. Great sequencing. We got to know that a classic album, the tracks have to make sense. Like as you're going from one track to the next, like something doesn't seem out of place. And it seems as almost like you're watching a movie, reading a book, or reading a story, or hearing a story. Like, everything sort of goes all into place, and the sequencing has a lot to go, too. Does this track sound great after this one? When you hit this track, and then you get from track 7 to 8 to 9, does it all sound sort of work out? It doesn't be like everything goes from track 1 to 5, and then from track 6 to 7, they seem out of place. Then things pick up again on tracks 8 and 9. So, the timing has to be well, meaning that everything has to be good. So, are some tracks not too long or some tracks not short or some tracks, everything great. And then overall, the length of the album, I think takes a place into it takes a, the length of the album, I think also takes some consideration as well, because sometimes you have to get into that sweet spot, right? You don't want to rush art and you don't want to shorten anything up, but you don't want the risk of making something way too long. Nobody likes anything in regards to like a movie. And sometimes a movie is great and you have a classic or potential classic of a movie, but it's just 30 or 45 minutes way too long. That's when you sort of mess up. So the timing, as far as the length is concerned, plays in that factor as well. To me, the content has to age well. It has to stand up. It has to be able to, as we say at the end of our podcast on The Vault, stand the test of time. The concept and the music, to me, have to be able to stretch across generations. And this is important because if you look at classic music outside of urban, classic urban music, if we go back to the old days of soul music and blues music and jazz, and you talk about at the beginning of recorded music of artists that were making music here in today's society, starting from way back in the 30s to 40s to 50s, you can see in all these different types of music that the content can stretch across generations from the people who were there when the albums first came out to the generations afterwards to the generations after them. When you have classic albums, the concept and the music, everything from the quality of the instruments to the music, to the drums, to the feeling has to be able to stretch across generations. It has to have replay value over time. Now we've seen this, right? And I think this is one of the biggest things that we talk about when it says for classic music it has to have replay value over time. One of the things I was looking at for the research for this segment was looking at an article in 2017 by The Undefeated, written by David Dennis Jr. Uh, this was talking about the criteria of a classic album. And so one of the things they talked about as far as what is the biggest dilemma as far as we're determining a classic, it's time. So... It's one thing that you look at it and you see if something is a classic immediately and you think it has that potential, but then 
as time goes on, you tend to forget about the album or you pop it in five to six to seven years later and you don't feel the same way about the album when you first put it in like that day that you bought it on the release date. And that's a big problem to me. I think that's one of the things that if you have a classic album, it has to have that characteristic. And the reception, I think, plays a part of into it, of it in well. And not just the fans' reception, but the media's reception, too. If you look at some of these albums that are certifiable, cl- certified classics, and, you know, you talk about the, the Illmatics, the Ready to Dies, the Life After Deaths, the Tupac's Me Against the Worlds, the It Takes a Nation and Millions to Hold Us Back, the America Smokes Wanted, Death Certificates, uh, Dr. Dre's The Chronic, Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style, Garface The Diary, just to name a few, Outkast, Equemni, Southern Playlist, the Cadillac Music, just to name a few. I mean, it's when you talk about the reception from both the fans and the media, I think has to sort of be in sync for it to be a certified classic. Like fans and critics alike can go and say, you know what? Yeah, it's a classic. It is. And here's the reason why. Now, fans will sort of give you a simplistic view of it, most of us, and those of us who are a little bit deeper into the culture, those of us who do shows like podcasters like myself will sort of get more into detail other than the average fan. But then what you also hear with the critics is that in doing these retrospective articles, which I read a lot of these, which I read a lot of these and leading up to the release of these episodes is that you can see the proof and also the research that goes into showing you how this is held up over time. So the reception plays a big part of it into it as well. So those are classic albums. Now, what about great albums? So as far as great albums are concerned, they, I think they have just about all the characteristics of a classic, but they're, I think just a step down and they deliver in most areas, but they have a few letdowns in a few. Now those letdowns could possibly be a few skips maybe a few cringeworthy moments that when you listen to an album, you're just like, oh, everything was going so well until I listened to this track or everything was going really well until I started hearing these series of skits. Maybe it has some elements that you think could have been left on the cutting room floor. We've heard that in a lot of great albums and the things that separate some great albums aside from being a classic is that they take that step down that there are either some songs or some elements or things in the direction that you think is like, maybe they could have done without this And this would be really, really good, but it does well, but doesn't really have that bit that classic albums have to get it over the top. Those are great albums. And there are tons and tons of great albums that have the potential to be classics, but there are things along that way that you see that after some time, when you look at it, there were some missteps that they could have possibly left out and the potential would have been there. Now, as far as a very good album, I would describe it as this. Solid overall, but not spectacular. I think it will stand up over the average in what we see in the industry, meaning par for the course album that's put out there. It will stand above the class, but it's not really going to stand against the elite. So I would take it as far as the classroom is concerned. It would be probably a B minus to B student, not a B plus. It will probably be a B plus to B minus to B student in regards to everybody else. Now, if classics are 100 or A pluses and great albums are A's or A minuses, then very good albums are B's, B plus, B, B minus. That's really what you have. It's a really, a, a really, really solid album, but over the average, but not really elite. It may be fun, possibly even catchy, may get some club spins, And, you know, definitely get some things as far as when it comes to some throwback uh, mixes from DJs you hear on the radio and on IG and Facebook nowadays with this quarantine. But it's something that doesn't have a great deal of replay value. And what I mean is, is that what I'll get into next is that you'll have that album that will have some really great songs on it. But the rest of the album, as far as the deep cuts are concerned, are not as good. The quality just doesn't hold on to you. So great in the moment, but not as great later on. Really, the big thing with a very good album versus a great album or a classic is it displays inconsistencies and is not present. That's not present in the other two. So really, it's all about consistency. And for a very good album, you don't get that as much as you have in the other two. Now, I want to talk a little bit about classic album versus memorable and classic songs. It is possible to have a great or very good album with classic songs on them, 
but they don't meet the criteria of being a classic. Now, some of the examples I wrote down about this, and there are tons of them out there, are Method Man, Stakal, Kanye's Graduation, and Jay-Z's Life and Time, the Sean Carter, Volume 3. All, I think, very good or great albums, but I don't think they meet the criteria of being classics. Now, you can pull classic songs from every single one of those albums. From Method Man's to Cal, you have, of course, All That I Need, Release Your Delph. You know, great, great songs on that album, One to Cal. Kanye's Graduation, they have great stuff, I Can't Tell Me Nothing. Jay-Z's Volume 3, of course, the biggest hit from that was Big Pimpin', stuff like Dope Man. I mean, really good and great classics, out classic songs, but not classic albums. And it's possible for that to happen. Now, classic songs can sometimes skew the overall perception of an album because people can attribute classics to the release of that album, the classic songs to that album based on the song, but won't necessarily dig deeper into the album. So... I don't want people to sort of get confused. Like, yeah, you have very good to great albums that have classic songs on them, but really to, I think where you get the criteria into the classic is how the rest of those deep album cuts make it. So it's possible for you to have memorable or classic songs on great to very good albums, but the album itself would not be a classic. I will say this classic songs on non-classic albums are important because they contribute to the culture. Now we could all know about some releases overall that were less than spectacular that were probably great to very good to just probably good or mediocre, but they have some classic songs on there. They all contribute to the culture, to things that, you know, like things in there, like songs that are made just for the club or for the party or for the cookout or for certain type of things like activities like smoking or sexing or chilling or something like that. They all contribute to the culture. So it's it's important for you to have classic songs on sometimes non-classic albums, and it boosts the profile of that album overall. And, of course, it's great for record sales because why do people buy albums? Sometimes because of the artist, but if you hear those songs, especially the way that we did, like my generation did, you hear that song on the radio, you go out and get that album. Even if the, the rest of the album isn't that great, you go out and get that album because it has that song or those songs on them. Now I want to talk about classics of then versus now. Now, this is the biggest debate when we talk about things and you see these arguments in social media. What I used to like to say, these were the lunch table discussions that we had when I was in high school in regards to what are the differences as far as classics as we determine them in my generation and before versus the classics that are defined by the generations after us. Differences in generations are going to determine the validity of all those classics. Now, we could take a look at our parents' generations, looking at, at our music as far as hip-hop and R&B, they looked at what their classics were in their time period, the music of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, depending on how old your parents are, and sometimes, in some instances, the music of the 80s versus our older siblings' generation, like my older siblings in my generation, the music of the 80s, the 90s, into the early 2000s. And we know that our parents thought that, and some of them may still think that hip-hop music is crap. And some of our older siblings who are of that generation may look at that and say hip hop music is crap or R&B music ain't like the way it used to be anymore or everything else. And even you'll look at the other genre we study reggae. There's some differences in the generations that people look at, at reggae and it could be you could even look at music like dub music and music like ska and traditional reggae lovers rock and roots and culture to the way that people looked at dance hall. And then even there's differences within dance hall, how people looked at dance hall back in the 80s and the 90s to how people looked at dance hall in the 2000s and the aughts and in the 2010s and as it is now, it's completely different. Now, my generation may think that the classics that we had during our coming of age, which from my generation, that was our late 80s into the early 2000s, that spanning pretty, pretty much that spanning of, let's say from 1988 until 2008. And we say that there are plenty of classics like the classics were plentiful in that particular time but we don't necessarily feel the same way now and in urban music all of them have changed if we can talk about hip-hop r&b and reggae they have all changed quite a bit how much hip-hop has changed it's changed a lot because now the characteristics of what people consider hip-hop are even things that we didn't consider hip-hop 10 to 20 years ago but hip-hop evolves r&b evolves reggae evolves things that we didn't necessarily consider hip-hop then can be considered hip hop now. So the generation of folks like our younger brothers and sisters, and for some of y'all, 
some of your kids, they're looking at who the top people are in the industry now and how they consume music and how they read the criticism of music and how the perception of music has changed a lot because they consume music differently than we do. They read and learn about musically differently than we did differently than also than our parents did back in the day as well. It's all really generational. Now the current generation is going to use similar criteria to determine their classics, whatever their criteria is. And to be quite honest, their criteria is not going to be that much different from a technical standpoint than ours, but their perception is going to be different because their perception of quality is going to be different than ours as well. Now what we may think is crap, they may think is great and they'll determine that based on whether an album is very good, great or classic, just like how we thought that the urban music, hip hop, reggae and R and B was classic versus our older siblings and our parents did how they thought our music was crap. So all things that are old become new again (laughs) and nothing is ever changing under the sun. And some releases now I think will stretch across generations and may meet that criteria. Now, just an idea as far as things, let's say, within the last decade or so that have come out that I think can meet this criteria, just to name a few, Lil Wayne's Carter 3, this is just my personal list, Lil Wayne Carter 3, Drake's Take Care, all three of Kendrick's releases, good LPs, by the way, Good Kid, Mad City, To Pimp a Butterfly, and Damn, J. Cole's 2014 Forest Hills Drive, Joey Badass 1999, Freddie Gibbs' Bandana, Rhapsody's Eve and or Layla's Wisdom, depending on what you like. Anderson Pack's Malibu, Ventura, depending on whatever it is that you prefer. Big Crit's Catalacta, Kanye's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, Jay-Z's 444, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot out there. And if you speak in the circles, there are people that will tell you that within the last decade, there are definitely albums that have the criteria and the early signs of being classics as time goes on. Now, if we're going by the vault criteria, that's all based off of starting at 20 years. So that the time, again, is is the biggest thing as stated in that undefeated article by by David Dennis, uh, as far as what the biggest dilemma as far as determining what a classic would be. And the biggest problem with us is that we look at a week after we listen to it the same day. This is a classic. This is a classic. This is a classic. And to me, I think the big part of that is euphoria. And the euphoria, I think, can distort your perception in as far as determining whether something is classic or not. But you've got to give this some time. Things will happen. There are times that we will let classic albums will release and we'll sleep on them. And then all of a sudden we'll turn around and then, hey, 10 years later, we're realizing we missed something. And by the 20 years comes around, we realize that we really slept on that album like Yomatic. You know, that's the way that it was. It, It didn't you know, amongst the critics and the industry, it was considered classic material, but the general public didn't pick up on this until probably after Nas' second album came out. It's all really a big debate. And so we know that things have to, it has to deal with quality, but when it comes to anything else, when it comes to determining a classic, it's really going to be subjective to either the generation or the crowd or whoever you're talking to. But I think we all understand and know that classic music has to have quality. And that's the one thing that no generation can argue with. It has to have quality. We have to have quality music and the quality and content has to stand up no matter what. I think that any generation, any culture, any crowd can agree that we have to have good quality content that sound technically, that makes you feel good emotionally. And years afterward, you can feel the same way, if not close to it than you did when you listen to it, when you first took the album out, the packaging for my generation, and when you first downloaded it and listened to it on your phone or through your Bluetooth speaker or in your car for other generations. There we have it, an episode of Cards, Dominoes, Drinks, and Smoke bonus content. So we want to hear more from y'all. I want to hear if you've been listening to this album, respond to us on the socials as far as what your definition of a classic is. And if you have any classic albums that have been released within the last decade, ones that you think that can potentially be determined classics in another 10 years or so, once we meet that criteria, 
go ahead and link it to us, man. On our social medias, you can reach us at Vault Classic on Twitter, at Vault CMR Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can reach us on the Vault Classic Music Reviews by reaching us. Make sure you follow and subscribe to both of them. And let's hear it from you guys. I want to hear to see if you have any albums within the last decade or so, let's say de- decade to 15 years, that you feel that within a few years will be determining those as classics because they stay in the test of time. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say, but hey, this classic debate, we can have these for decades and decades, and I'm sure for another decade after this, we'll be talking about this topic as far as classic music. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you check us out on our host, Podbean, vaultcmr.podbean.com. You can also download, stream, subscribe, and listen to The Vault CMR on many of our streaming platforms. If you go to Instagram, Twitter, or also our Facebook, the link to our link tree is in our bio. There you can get to all of our streaming platforms where we are, and then also all of our social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You can go to all of them again, Instagram at Vault CMR Podcast, Twitter at Vault Classic, and also Facebook and YouTube, The Vault Classic Music Reviews. On Instagram, you can follow me personally on at It's Lesson. That's at It's Lesson, I-T-S Lesson. And you can also follow the Lesson Facebook page as well for me personally to be able to connect with me personally. I love to be able to hear with you guys. Let's keep interacting. Let's keep this thing going. We appreciate all the support. And if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. As we close, we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and follow us on Facebook at IV Creative and Instagram at IVECRE8.